Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us. This is the last uh, IMAG MSM working group on multi scale modeling for viral pandemics of April. It's hard to believe that it's already turning into May. Uh, we have two great speakers lined up today. They both very generously agreed to stay for discussions afterwards. And depending on the tenor of the discussions, we'll either use the breakout rooms or have an open pit uh, to discuss. As usual, I need to remind you that this content is being live streamed on YouTube. It's being recorded and these recordings will be archived and made publicly available. The usual preamble that we have myself, James Glazier and Reinhard Labenbacher as co-leads. Reinhard is driving today, so he's not able to attend the meeting. Uh, he sends his regrets. Uh, we have Jim Sluka and Bruce Shapiro on the call. Uh, you've had interactions with them, and I hope uh, they'll help uh, you in any ways that you need. If you have any issues, concerns about anything to do with the meetings, uh, please do let us know and we'll do our best to address them. We have the various uh, modern means of communication. Uh, we definitely appreciate your help uh, in publicizing our work. And uh, we have Slack channel, Twitter channel. We have the official IMAG MSM wiki pages, which always need love and attention. Uh, there is now an IMAG LinkedIn page uh, to which you can refer. Please consider joining that. And we have the YouTube channel, uh, which distributes our videos. So please help us out. Uh, we have great talks. We have great speakers. Uh, please help us reach the broadest audience possible for this wonderful work. And now, following our recent protocol, I'd like to open the meeting for any quick announcements. I have an announcement, which is that we'll have our regular steering committee meeting tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, if you need, think that you need to be in the steering committee and you haven't been invited, please contact us to discuss that. Uh, otherwise, uh, the usual suspects tomorrow at 11. Is there any other announcements that people would like to make before we get started with the uh, main business? Okay, I don't see anybody speaking up. So I'll re briefly review our schedule for upcoming meetings and mini seminars. Um, next week, we have uh, some industry representative uh, talking about application of mechanistic model to design RTI prophylaxis. Uh, we have uh, talks coming up uh, by a review of, uh, by Fred Adler of the Viral Evolution Subgroup as an update. And John Rice also, so that's more of a business meeting, updating us on the uh, extensive work he's been doing on the dissemination outreach subgroup. Uh, May 20th, we have a single speaker, Rusty Irving, uh, who is one of the developers of the original digital twin concept who will be addressing us. Uh, May 27th, we have the noted science writer and former nature editor, Philip Ball, uh, speaking to us uh, along with another uh, scientific speaker. And I should say that we're currently trying to line up uh, additional speakers from the press. We have, uh, thanks to Eric's work, uh, connections to uh, one of the main Associated Press reporters uh, who cover science issues and also the one of the chief uh, science writers for USA Today who've agreed to speak to us. So we're looking forward to that. As always, we would appreciate your suggestions for future speakers. Uh, if you have connections, especially to clinical, uh, experimental, or uh, pharma or industry uh, speakers, uh, we definitely want this meeting to be connecting modelers to clinicians and experimentalists and to industry. And so your help uh, in reminding potential speakers that they can be talking about clinical trials, they can be talking about drug discovery. Uh, you don't have to be a modeler to speak here. Uh, that uh, would be much appreciated. 
As usual, our rules of the meeting, since the talks themselves are so short, uh, we will hold questions until we get through both talks uh, to make sure that our speakers have as much time as possible uh, to give their presentations. Uh, if there's time for questions during the main meeting, we ask that people keep them general and short. And then we have our half hour uh, open pit discussion where people uh, can take the gloves off and have whatever interactions they feel are appropriate. I will break in and give a five minute warning to our speakers. Uh, I hope you won't be offended. Uh, just to make sure that we stay on track so that both speakers get to finish their talks. Our first speaker today is Penelope Morrell uh, from Pittsburgh. As you know, I don't usually do an elaborate uh, introduction. Uh, we better to save time for the talks themselves. And so I will turn it over to Penelope. Okay, thank you, James. Um, I guess I should share my screen. Um, can you see that okay? Is it all? And, and you can hear me or hear me okay? Okay, so um, a bit of a disclaimer before I start. Um, I'm an immunologist. I'm not um, a modeler and um, I have become involved, um, but as you'll see, I have become involved with um, several modeling groups um, over the last year. And so um, my perspective is really from someone who um, um, studies immunology and who, um, and who is um, interested in this topic. And so I'm gonna give you uh, perspective, not just not really my own work, but also, but how I look at the um, the, pro the problem and how we've how I've been able to um, help with some modeling um, aspects. So this is kind of the overview of what I'm going to tell you about. Just uh, I'm sure I don't need to go into too much detail about um, SARS-CoV-2, um, the innate immune response, the adaptive immune response. And then some of the factors that distinguish um, mild and severe disease um, and um, how um, two sort of modeling um, uh, projects that I've been involved with. One is a sort of multi-scale tissue simulator using the physicel um, approach. Um, and uh, another is um, um, modeling um, using a, a larger uh, model to develop a um, virtual patient cohort, which can be used to explore um, predisposition to severe disease. And these projects have been done mostly in, in, entirely in collaboration with um, Morgan Craig, Adrienne Jenner, Amber Smith, and Courtney Davis. And I'll try and, and I'll, if I have time, I'll end up with some new challenges and questions that I think are still remaining that would be of um, potential interest um, to pursue. So, um, just a brief overview. We know um, SARS-CoV-2, it's uh, an important pandemic right now. Um, over 150 million people have been infected with 3 million deaths. And obviously it's, it's rampaging throughout um, countries such as India and Brazil. Um, and interestingly, most individuals have an asymptomatic or mild disease, but the problem is caused by um, a significant proportion, 15% that require hospitalization um, and 5% that um, develop severe disease. And this creates, this may, these numbers may seem small, but when you have a large population of infected individuals, these numbers rapidly increase and become uh, an issue for healthcare services and so forth. Um, it's a complex disease and the immune response is interesting to this virus. It's both important for viral elimination, but also it plays an important role in, um, in severe um, disease. Um, and obviously, as you know, we now have several effective vaccines um, that have been developed and these are beginning to have an impact in countries that are able to um, distribute this vaccine widely. Um, another issue that a couple of issues that are of concern still is um, are that some individuals are developing some long term health issues so called long haulers and these may have 
um, relationship to the immune response um, to the virus, and obviously the emergence of new, new variants are posing a major challenge. Um, so this is just an um, overview of the symptoms and, and, and signs, which I think you're probably all familiar with. Um, we, um, it's um, associated with pneumonia, um, loss of sense and smell, and it can be um, with severe disease, you can get multi-organ um, involvement and failure. Um, and um, severe disease is associated with a number of comorbidities that are outlined here. Um, usually when we think of this um, disease, there's a, a person becomes infected. There's a short sort of prodromal period where before symptoms start. And this is um, a, a period where the disease can be transmitted from person to person. And um, following that um, symptoms or onset, there's a, a peak of viral load about three days and, and then the immune system will kick in with um, um, antibody production. Um, and if people go on to develop severe disease, this may occur um, around 10 days or so after the initial onset of symptoms. Um, so this is sort of a general scheme of how we think about this. The virus is a, um, an RNA virus that um, is, enters cells through binding to specific receptors, the ACE2 receptor. Um, when it enters the cell, it replicates its um, RNA um, to produce um, new viral particles that, that are released. Um, during this process, um, cells will sense the presence of these um, viral proteins and RNA and will release um, um, innate immune signals such as type 1 interferon as well as pro-inflammatory pro cytokines. And these play important roles both in um, preventing the further disease but also can contribute to um, to the um, inflammatory process. And, um, uh, and then we have um, production of specific T cells, antibodies, and B cells, which um, can um, neutralize and um, remove the virus. Um, we do know that um, we have um, good adaptive T cell responses. Um, this is a, one of the early studies that um, looked at um, uh, CD4 T cell responses to a, a panel of um, epitopes um, that span the entire viral genome. And you can see that most of the TCR, T cells respond to proteins that are the structural proteins, the um, spike protein, um, the matrix protein, and the inner um, protein. Um, but you do see responses to um, many, many of the open reading frames um, uh, in the virus. <laughs> Interestingly, um, these, these are all SARS um, recovered patients, um, and these are supposedly unexposed um, individuals. And we do see um, about 40% of people who have been apparently unexposed or at least exposed perhaps to common cold coronaviruses do have um, T cell and, and, and T cell responses that can recognize um, SARS um, CoV 2 antigens. Um, but um, in people who have recovered from um, disease, 100% um, of them have good CD4 responses as well as antibodies um, to, um, to the virus. Um, so what do we know about factors that contribute to disease severity? Well, we know that I mentioned the interferon response is important. And if this response is blunted or delayed, um, this, this is likely to result in um, um, more severe disease. Um, severe disease is associated with a so-called cytokine storm with elevated levels of um, inflammatory cytokines. Um, there is, sorry, um, a recruitment of neutrophils to the lung, which normally um, does not occur in viral infections. And also there's a depletion of the adaptive immune cells such as CD4 and CD8 cells, which, um, also, which is associated with severe disease. So if we look at this um, in a sort of schematic, a normal mild infection, you'd have an early interferon or innate response that can um, prevent the spread of the virus. <clears throat> um, so the viral load um, peaks and then um, is, is cleared as the antibodies and T cells um, are, are, are um, elicited. 
in severe infection, this interferon or in, innate response is, is delayed initially and is, or is, is less strong. Um, so the virus can um, ex um, become expand further. And then the immune response gets really out of control. And so you get um, an excessive innate immune response. So this is not only interferon, but also inflammatory cytokines such as IL-6. And the T cells, the adaptive response, really never take off um, in this situation. So you end up with um, more severe disease. And this is kind of schematically um, pictured again here, which I won't um, go through. The interferon, type one interferon, is not only important for stimulating the adaptive immune response, but it also um, prevents viral replication and protects additional cells from becoming um, further infected. Um, and this is just another um, demonstration of um, how in the normal response, you may, you'll get good viral clearance with um, neutralizing antibodies, um, CD4 and CD8 T cells that can clear um, infected cells. Whereas in a severe situation, um, you have um, dysregulated um, cytokine production, excessive cytokine production, neutrophils coming in and T cells are unable to um, clear the virus. So in terms of um, how we could think about modeling some of these things. These are some of the factors that are important, so-called viral factors, um, how viruses have, um, can interact with the um, interferon pathway um, to inhibit this pathway. They can also in induce pro-inflammatory cytokines and induce um, sort of more inflammatory types of cell death, which um, leads to excess inflammation um, there's a local um, tissue immune response, which is important. And then uh, the lymph node response, which allows for the active, um, generation of antibodies, CD4 and CD8 T cells. So I'm going to just show you some um, of the um, results um, that we have been working on with the physicel model. So we've been focusing on the Im immune group with the sort of local tissue immune response to, um, to, um, to the virus. and this is um, sort of a general scheme of how um, this works. We have a, um, a tissue grid, which is representing the lung. Um, and these are epithelial cells um, that can become infected with virus. And then we have various um, cell, they can become infected and die. And then we have various immune cells, macrophages, neutrophils, dendritic cells, and T cells that, um, um, sort of interact um, with the affected cell to um, um, either clear the virus or um, um, cause, cause more damage. Um, and um, so I'm just going to show you, um, this is one of the, um, the latest um, um, representations of, of this. And you can see the um, blue cells here are the epithelial cells. And the virus is entering, you know, from here. And the yellow, as they become infected, um, they turn yellow. And in this particular scenario, we're actually able to um, clear the virus through um, um, recruitment of macrophages, T cells, and um, some some neutrophils. And if you look at these um, here, you can see the um, the virus um, eventually gets cleared. We have um, Macrophage, activated macrophages um, coming and going down. And then um, I think over here, you can also see the, the diffusion of um, various um, chemokines and the uh, interferon pathway as, as this occurs um, um, over time. And so this um, scenario, this obviously we, we're, we're modeling a good um, clearance of the virus. And I, I have to say that um, it's actually proven difficult to uh, actually clear the most of the early our own early uh, attempts with this um, either the virus or the immune system would just kill the entire tissue but um, under this um, condition these conditions we're able to clear the virus and so I think this gives us a good opportunity then to modulate some of the factors the immune factors and viral factors and to determine um, how how we may go from mild to um, more severe disease. 
So um, I'm, I'm just, in the sake of time, I'm really just giving a very sh um, quick overview of what we've been doing here. But um, this um, other approach um, has been, um, this is um, Morgan Craig's um, group really pioneered this type of, of approach. And um, the, um, they generate a, a large mechanistic model of the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 and this involves um, the virus, um, infected cells, uh, macrophages, um, um, neutrophils and, and T cells and this um, is um, the large model is validated with a number of um, um, data sets um, infection from, from many different sources um, and using once this has been, this was um, you, you can find details of all of this in this bioarchive preprint that was um, recently uh, uploaded. Um, but the interesting part of this is that you using this model, um, we created a cohort of about 200 virtual patients, and by varying the range um, plus or minus 20% of seven parameters in the model, and these parameters were all related to macrophage IL-6 and interferon production. And um, so each individual patient has a particular value for these, for these parameters. Um, and um, looking um, at the, um, um, how these, the, these are put through the model and then the values um, for each individual patient are sort of it's assessed to make sure that they fall for, for, for most of these um, readouts that they fall within known physiological ranges. So for viral load or for interferon production. And so then a patient can be um, picked um, based on that and then is assigned to this cohort of um, 200 patients. And um, this then we can look at the infection um, with SARS-CoV-2 and look at the outcome of the infection. And so just to sort of orient you here, this um, value is um, sort of a value that um, corresponds to um, high degree of, um, the higher this value is, the worse the disease is. So it's a combination of the um, IL-6 concentration, the number of neutrophils, and the actually not undamaged, but damaged lung tissue. And so what you can see in these graphs is that we have the 200 patients here that are all ordered in terms of um, inflammatory markers. So the, the, the ones up here with the highest um, have the highest inflammatory marker. So these are basically the 200 patients in order. And we plot these um, in relationship to um, um, various factors. And obviously IL-6 is included in this marker. So it's not surprising that you see IL-6 levels really follow quite closely um, this, this order. One thing I think that was of interest, um, and you can see also here, this is the T cell um, level, which um, as, as patients get more severe disease in this model, the T cells um, are reduced um, in number, which is um, what we see. One thing that was of interest here is if you look, this is the, the time for the interferon peak so this I mentioned to you that delayed interferon is, is, is a bad prognosticator for, for disease. And here we see that if the inter peak of interferon is um, around two days, these patients cluster with a low level of um, infl inflammation marker. And um, if the peak is um, above four days, then this seems to sort of correspond to the patients with more, more severe disease. I have um, to break in with my five minute warning. Okay, I'm almost. <laughs> and, um, and so this, we can then look to see what parameters are driving this, this, uh, this factor. And there are two main um, ones that we can see here. So I'm um, just, again, these are the 200 patients with, um, that are ordered by, um, um, uh, and then here is the value of the differentiation rate, one of the parameters that was used to differ, um, distinguish the patients. 
And, um, and again, this is the red ones here have um, the low uh, less than two um, of the interferon peak. And you can see that these, um, um, as this parameter increases, um, you, you see a change in the interferon peak level. Um, this is also to some extent correlated with the production rate of interferon. Um, so um, what I just wanted to um, finish up with is just some new challenges and questions that remain. Um, you know, how durable are memory responses um, post-infection, post-vaccination? What is long COVID and how, how is the immune system involved? And what, what will the impact of new viral variants um, be on the uh, uh, pandemic? And you know, we're already seeing um, some of that effect in, in India. Um, and obviously the big questions are how effective are vaccines and how can we improve vaccination strategies as well as distribution of vaccines. Um, this is a stu recent study that showed that um, memory responses in patients that had mostly mild disease are quite persistent and certainly um, um, at one and six months. Um, it's, it's suggested also that actually responses to vaccine are even more persistent than mild disease. So I think that's a, a good um, um, a good a good point. Um, these uh, um, just to orient you, the, these uh, are all different types of immune responses and the black here have um, um, antibodies as well as CD4 and CD8 T cells to um, um, they have all, all six of the, all five of these um, responses. The one that seems to fall out most quickly is the CD8 T cell response. Um, I won't really go into this, but this is um, long COVID. And there are a number of patients you may have seen who develop these um, long lasting symptoms. And it's, this is going to be an issue that we will have to um, address um, from the immune perspective in the future. And then of course the, um, vir the viral um, variants, um, as we know, can, um, could escape. Um, they tend to um, improve the in infectivity um, because they can bind to the receptor much better or they um, cause more, um, um, more escape from the immune system so that they um, escape um, maybe more likely to lead to more severe disease. And so, um, I think we're at risk of this type of situation, especially since countries such as Brazil and, uh, and now India are unable to control their infections. Um, and so th this just becomes a, um, a sort of real breeding ground for new variants. And um, so we're going to, this is going to be a, um, a problem that we will have to face. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge um, really the, the modelers in all of this. Um, I'm just really reporting on, on uh, as I say, my role has really been to try and keep them, keep the, the immunology um, correct and uh, up to um, uh, speed. And, um, but the, the modeling work that I've showed you has really been done by um, all of these people with particularly um, Adrian Jenner, who's um, done most of the, um, the, the legwork on, on all of this. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your willingness to speak in such a compressed format, but I think <laughs> it's a wonderful presentation, a lot of interesting biology, and uh, I hope we'll make some additional contacts and some new collaborations out of this. So thank you again. Now we'll move on uh, we'll we'll hold the questions until the until the until the next uh, talk is over. So our next talk is uh, by uh, Catherine Morse, uh, who is coming to us from California and Johns Hopkins and APL, uh, and she's going to be talking about something about. As superficially about as far from what we've just heard as possible, but which is critical to the translational aspect of the things that we're doing, which is how does what do what does what build standards Would that be that the kind of modeling we're talking about potentially could be used uh, in things like FDA approvals, uh, clinical trials, 
uh, and potentially also in the design of therapies. And so without more ado, I will turn it over to Catherine. Thank you, James. Let's see if it's actually gonna let me share. It's complaining at the moment. Hmm. Ah, there we go. I apologize for the delay. It's um, being somewhat non-responsive. Hopefully this will get cleared up once I can start actually sharing. All righty, can folks see my screen and hear me okay? Not yet. We can hear you. Oh, there's a screen. There it is. Okay, something's going on with my computer. It's being particularly slow today. So we'll just see if it'll cooperate in any useful sort of way. Ah, okay, hopefully that works. Okay, um, so um, first of all, James, thank you for both the invitation to speak and for that um, actually very helpful and, and precise uh, introduction. So uh, I do work for the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, but I'm going to talk to you today about my decades long work uh, with an organization called SISO, the Simulation Interoperability Standards Organization. Um, I've held a number of leadership positions in this organization, including two uh, very long, very successful terms as the chair of the Standards Activity Committee, which is responsible for the execution of SISO's primary mission, which is not surprisingly standards. Um, I currently serve on the executive committee and the board of directors, and I am going to be talking today about standards and standards development. And as James pointed out, um, I think in that this will be um, valuable information for you going forward as you start thinking about how might um, how might you build your own standards in, in a way that will help you to um, collaborate more as a community. So um, this is the, our CISO vision and mission statement. So our vision is, to, is that we're an organization dedicated to the promotion of modeling and simulation interoperability and reuse for the benefit of diverse MS communities, including developers, procurers, and users worldwide. Now, <clears throat> if, um, if you've been engaged in CISO for many years, and I, I think probably John's the only, John Rice is the only other person here to whom that might apply, um, you would see that we've done a lot of standards in the area of defense simulation, because that's where our roots are. Uh, but that's not all we do. And in fact, a number of the standards that we do, which I'm gonna talk to you about today, are not focused on defense simulation, but on more on simulation interoperability in general, because um, I will say over the course of my long and checkered career, that people have come to me and said, well, we don't think what SISO does is gonna be applicable to what we do because our modeling domain is very different. And I, so I will just say this up front: I recognize that your modeling domain is significantly different than my modeling domain, but the issues of simulation interoperability, in my experience, are always the same. So with that, our mission is to develop, maintain, manage, and, and promulgate user-driven, and that's very important, user-driven standards that improve the technical quality and cost efficiency of m and impl implementations across the worldwide m and community. And the user-driven is very important. I'll just say this, um, every once in a while, someone will say to me, hey, SISO should develop the following standard because I think it's a good idea. <clears throat> SISO has exactly one employee, one. Um, he is, he's our executive director and he's responsible for keeping the financial and sort of administrative uh, mechanics of the organization working. But everything that we do as an organization to develop standards is done by the users or the volunteers, people like me, where we bring our own expertise. And so this is very much a, um, a forum to come together to develop various types of standards that meet your needs. Um, and I will say, just shameless plug for SISO if you decide to do standards. Um, we spent a lot of time working out the policies and procedures for developing standards and the infrastructure for doing that. And I'm here to tell you, having lived through the pain of most of that, that it's a great deal of work. And if you can avoid doing it yourself, I would. So 
That's my shameless plug for SISO. If you decide you need standards, please come see us first before you decide to do all that work yourself. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk a little bit about standards development, and then I'm, at the end, I'm going to talk about some standards which might already be applicable to where you might be going. Okay, so here's some personal axioms on standards. And so you see this little um, cabbage icon at the bottom. Uh, as John Rice will recall, I years ago, I wrote this briefing called um, The Standards Cabbage Patch, Where Do Standards Come From? And it's sort of a tongue-in-cheek reflection on decades of developing standards. So um, uh, it might not be 100% factual. It's, it's definitely one woman's opinion, but there, I think, is a great deal of fundamental truth in here. So those axioms include the following, that standards are driven by the market, which is to say the buyers. And those standards free the buyers from being locked into a single vendor. And over time, this should have the effect of driving down prices in the market. So you can see how this works um, you know, in our day-to-day -day life, right? Yeah. So IEEE maintains the 802.11 standard, which is the Wi-Fi standard. Um, and if you buy that standard, you could start your own company you know, building wireless routers. <clears throat> it's not like Somebody like Cisco could go, hey, nobody else can use this protocol. It's all us. You have to buy all your routers from us, right? So, so that's the benefit to the users. I maintain that all standards are fundamentally about interoperability, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is to say, if I want to pick up something and use it somewhere else, that's interoperability. Now, sometimes it's interoperability writ small, but it's interoperability nonetheless. So... Um, I made the, the next point a little bit on the last slide, which is standards development requires people. Like I said, SISO only has one employee. It, it requires people and it requires committed people. Okay, so it's typical in standards development activities that you'll have um, a lot of people who participate just in sort of an observational role. That's not, um, I'm not, I don't mean to discourage that, but if, if everyone's doing that, then there's no one doing the heavy lifting of, of actually doing work. Now, I'm, I'm leading an effort now, I'm gonna talk about the end called the cyber data exchange model. There are a handful of us, about 10 or 15, and we're really doing the development, but there are a lot of other people engaged because they're paying attention, because they're planning to use the standard when they're done and they're just watching. But if you're gonna do standards, people have to commit their time to doing it. Um, Absolutely, infrastructure and process are required, but they're not enough. You also say, and it's almost always the case that standards aren't done. They need to evolve as technology and user requirements evolved. And if they're not evolving with those, uh, with the technology and user requirements, then they need to go. <clears throat> the last one is kind of the more tongue in cheek perspective on this. Everyone wants an efficient, responsive standards process. Sure, we can all agree on that. But what they mean is it delivers the changes I want rapidly and it never changes the things I don't want changed. So, <clears throat> gee, that would be swell. Um, I will tell you, I'm in the you know, simulation standards field, I'm very well known, but I've lost votes. Okay, there have been things I really wanted and I really lobbied for and I lost the vote. Things happen, time to move on. So, with that, uh, what is a standard? So this one is also from the standards cabbage patch. There are things called de facto or in practice standards. And people use the term standard interchangeably sometimes. And, you know, because I do this a lot, it kind of makes me twitch. But um, sometimes people use it for technologies or protocols. And sometimes it's we refer to these as little s standards. So like, you know, lowercase, not uppercase. So for example, I'm using PowerPoint. I think the last group will probably use PowerPoint. There are other tools, but mostly we all use PowerPoint. But that's not a standard because Microsoft controls it, right? So nobody gets to vote except Microsoft. So for, for those of you who are serious standards folks, like I am not really a standard. Um, my preference is for de jure standards, which is by law standards. And those are developed by standards development bodies with legal and recognized standing. Oh, uh, this says a representative list of such organizations is at the end of this briefing. I apologize, I should have taken that out. That slide's not in this briefing, but they're, you know some of their names, right? ISO, IEEE, they're, um, I apologize, I don't know in your field who makes the standards, but, or, or who's the standards developing organization, but everybody who has standards has a standards developing organization. Um, 
for people like me, for the high-level architecture for modeling and simulation, that's IEEE. CISO is also a standards developing organization in its own right. So we develop IEEE standards and we also develop CISO standards. Second shameless plug for CISO, unlike the IEEE, we give away our standards for free. Okay. So this is, with all that background, processes that generally apply in open standards development. And, um, and a lot of these are driven by antitrust laws, at least here in the US. So, you, you know, it sort of keeps you from developing an, a monopoly with respect to things. So, A, an authoritative body establishes policies, procedures, and processes and ensures they are followed. Uh, membership in the standards development process is not unduly restrictive, which is to say you can't go, oh, hey, if you want to vote, you have to pay a million dollars. Voting rights are uniformly and fairly applied. At each stage of the development, members are allowed to comment and given sufficient time to do so. So sometimes people go, oh, I don't want to do a standard because it takes a long time. And I'll just say the following thing. I understand that. That is true, but it's not the entire truth. The problem is getting people to agree takes a long time. Okay, so if you care about people agreeing, <laughs> it's going to take a while. Um, I do some of this um, in the defense domain where we don't actually vote, but we still have to get everybody to agree. And by the way, those people are really, really set in their ways and getting them to agree is very hard. And so the whole, you know, counting votes and making sure you wrote down exactly what your comment resolution was is not the problem. It's getting people to agree and that takes time. Okay, um, consensus but not unanimity must be achieved, right? Like I said on the previous slide, or the, the one before that, um, I've lost votes. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm only one vote. So there's your, your uh, voting rights uniformly and fairly applied. And, you know, we didn't have unanimity. I voted no. It's, you know, I mean, I voted yes and everybody else voted no. So I didn't get my way. It happens. Okay. The standard is made readily available. And, and um, so that's not like, oh, yeah, we developed a standard, but nobody can see it. Um, this might be with or without a license fee. You could see how um, an exorbitant license fee might qualify as not being readily available. So um, you have to be able to get the standard. And then there's periodic review and update performed to ensure continuing eff e efficacy, easy for me to say, of standards. So you have to go back and look at the standard periodically. So here's a quick snapshot of what um, CISO standards development process looks like. And like I said, most of them look somewhat like this. Um, there's an activity approval, so you do a product nomination. So a bunch of people who think that there's enough, um, enough technical substance and enough existing consensus about something do a product nomination. It gets approved. Um, you start the process of developing the product, and so you have to draft the product. Now, most of these boxes, the size of these boxes, are determined by the size of the font, but the amount of effort in these boxes is not reflected in the size of the boxes because Box two is the big one. That's where all the real work is. Then there are um, other mechanical processes like balloting. So you have to actually vote on the final thing and respond to comments. Uh, there's a product approval step. And, you know, so this is part of the infrastructure of a, CISO, of a, CISO, of a, a standards development organizations process where um, the, the processes of the organization have to check that you follow the process. That you, you know, so all those rules I just gave you about voting rights being uniformly applied and people adhering to the process, that's where this sort of thing gets checked to make sure that that everybody who was a member got heard and didn't get shut down unfairly. Uh, and then in CISA, we have these things called product support groups. And this is the part where you go, okay, is the standard still relevant? Um, people have questions, we need to answer their questions and periodically go, oh, it, it's time to maybe look at revising the standard because technology has changed or user requirements have changed. So that's, that's kind of CISO's process. But like I said, most standards development processes are something like this. Okay, <clears throat> so here's some CISO standards of potential interest. Um, the first handful are about federation engineering. And just loosely, that means um, you've got a bunch of simulations and they, uh, they weren't they probably weren't initially designed to work together. And now you've decided, hey, these five simulations, if we could bring them together, if we could make them talk together, we could build 
basically a larger simulation that would solve a bigger problem. I was talking to some folks the other day about the pandemic and, okay, but what other impacts are there? Like when people leave the hospital, but they're not entirely well, how do we see the epidemiology evolving based on their demographics and the kind of household they live in? Okay, so in order to do that, you need not just your epidemiology model, but you need your demographics model. And you probably also need something that represents pattern of life. So do those people, like, for example, I have the, uh, you know, I have the good fortune to be able to work here in my office at home, and I've been doing so for the last 14 months. I almost never interact with, with anybody except my husband. But, you know, if I were in retail sales, I'd have to be in contact with people every day. That changes my risk factor. So that's the idea. We're bringing all these simulations together. So we've got four standards in this domain, the distributed simulation engineering and execution process, the federation engineering agreements template, the si simulation interoperability readiness levels, which is work in progress, and verification, validation, and accreditation. Um, that's an overlay to that first standard. So those are all general purpose. So it doesn't matter what you're simulating, or maybe it's more appropriate to say, it doesn't matter what you're modeling. If you decide to bring your simulations together, these are gonna help you identify and address issues that you're gonna find. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the HLA, which is actually the mechanism by which you might integrate things. And then I mentioned earlier, I might talk about the CyberDAM, that's the Cyber Data Exchange Model. Clearly the content of that is not relevant to what you're doing, but the process is valuable. So with that, <clears throat> so here's the DC, and this is actually the peak of the Federation Engineering um, uh, Pyramid. And this is a generalized systems engineering process for building and executing distributed simulation applications. And, um, um, and distributed is really general in the sense. It should, could just be multiple simulations running on the same computer, but that aren't um, that aren't integrated into one monolithic piece of software. Because one of the um, challenges that people initially foresee when they talk about putting these simulations together is they say, oh, well, we're going to have to rewrite them all to talk to each other. Or, you know, this one's in C++ and this one's in Java. How are we going to get them to talk to each other? So I'm going to talk about HLA in a minute, which is a standard that lets you put those things together. But, um, but this is about just bringing all those together. So um, this is basically a systems engineering process. It leads you through the stages of asking all the right questions at the right time. Um, it gives you ideas about processes to perform, about documentation to develop. So, because remember, you're, you're now getting out of the realm where a single person or a small core team of developers is working together. Now you've got a bigger group and you've got to work, you've got to be more intentional about um, about working together. So that's what this is. Systems engineering for your distributed simulations. Okay, so if we start up at the DSEEP and now we're working down in more detail, one of the things that the DSEEP says is you're gonna need um, federation engineering agreements. And these are really specific things about how you're, how you're gonna make things talk to each other, not the big things, the little things. So for example, Hey, if you're doing um, faster than real time simulation, right? And you've got to have, so you've got to have some sort of uh, discrete event simulation engine, and that discrete event simulation has to have a time scale. What's your time scale? You've got to agree about what that is. Things like that. Um, if uh, you know, if it matters how particular phenomena are modeled within individual simulations, then. You've got to know that because, you know, I'm going to come to VVNA in a minute, but you've got to know what those representations are. Even though they're in separate simulations, how those things are represented impact how relevant they are to other simulations. And so that's the kind of stuff you need to resolve as you're going through the DC. And then the feat gives you um, a way to record those. It also is kind of a checklist. So you go, hey, does this thing apply to us? Are we going to have an issue with this? Um, and if we are, we need to decide that. And if we're not, we can just check it off and go, okay, that doesn't matter to us. So for example, there's something in here called dead reckoning that you, you do with, you know, things moving around and how fast they're moving and, you know, where they're going to be in the future. It completely I doesn't apologize to break yeah. in, but just giving you your five minute warning. 
Okay, I better speed up. So anyway, um, that's sort of the checklist. Okay, this is something we're working on now, right now, and this is about figuring out if you have enough, um, if you have enough documentation to figure out if you can put standards together. We do this all the time, and it's a huge mistake. We go, oh, this simulation does something I need, and this simulation does something I need. Let's put them together before we ever ask, is that going to work? Like, can we even put them together? How much work is it going to be to put them together? Are the results going to be valid? And we we often charge into these things and don't ask those questions, and we get ourselves in a world of hurt. And so that's what this is about. Okay, so here's the HLA. And um, in, maybe in some ways, this is the most germane to what you might be doing next, which is to say, hey, we have these simulations. It seems like if we could just plug them together, they could share results in real time. So instead of, you know, I take your output file and I use it as input to, to my simulation, um, if, if we want to see how these things interact in real time, we need to actually have them communicate. So <clears throat> the HLA is a standard for simulation interoperability. It's a functional standard. And what that means is the standard itself says, if you go, if you go buy a piece of software that implements this standard, we call them a runtime infrastructure or RTI. You can, you can buy those commercially. There are a couple of open source ones. Um, here's what that infrastructure is gonna do for you. So when you get to the part where you go, we need to get these things to talk to each other, I would ask that you go look at this first before you decide to build your own because it took decades to get where we are on this. And, um, and there are a lot of, of subtleties of making these things work together properly um, that at, at first blush might seem like no big deal. Oh, hey, we just you know pass data back and forth, but there are actually quite a few um, intricacies to doing that. And um, I'm actually working on a project now where um, the project is using HLA, but they're using the 25 year old version. And about once every six months, they discover some horrible problem that they're having to deal with, which we solved 20 years ago. And they go, but we don't want to change the version because we'll have to change the APIs. And it's like, well, okay, but there are all these problems we already solved. Maybe you should just use the new version. So, and um, I teach tutorials on this all the time. So if you if you get to the point where you decide, hey, we should make our simulations talk to each other, please call me up again and I'll be happy to explain this in detail. Okay, last slide. Cyber data exchange model. Once again, <clears throat> this standard itself is not relevant to what you're doing, but the process we're using is. And in fact, we had a meeting earlier today and what we're doing is a data exchange model is a runtime data exchange model. So I said, you know, HLA, you get things to talk to each other. One of the things you have to agree on to make that work is what data gets exchanged between your simulations and what's the actual representation of it. So what types of data are important? What are the semantics of that data? And what are the data types? And so <clears throat> yeah, what we did here was we, we got a bunch of people together who are working in the area and who are doing some amount of data exchange now. And we developed use cases. We said, okay, here's, here's my use case. I need these kinds of simulations to communicate. They're representing this kind of attack. What kind of data needs to go into that? And we're in that process now. We did use cases. From that, we derived requirements. From that, we built our first draft. And, uh, and now we're going back and revisiting that and going through the standards development process. We've submitted comments against that and we're resolving those as a team. Once again, the sort of consensus but not unanimity process. And we'll refine our first draft based on that. And I expect sometime later this year, we'll get to balloting and we'll have a standard for this. But um, that's just, there are processes for doing these things. So, and I guess questions come up later. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. I know that that's hard to, that's an enormous amount of material to present in, in a very short uh, format, but I think you addressed a whole bunch of issues that we should be much more, we need to be very aware of. Just to finish uh, before we start our discussion, uh, we always appreciate your input and suggestions. Uh, please let us know how we could do better on these meetings. We're always available to do that. Uh, and that then uh, will be the end of the formal meeting. 
Uh, we have time for one general question before we open the breakout rooms. Is there one question to ask either of our speakers before we go move to the open pit discussions? I actually have a, a gen general question about organization uh, to our two speakers. Would you prefer to be put into breakout rooms uh, to have uh, separate discussions or would you rather have a single forum where everyone talks at the same time? Topics are pretty different. Okay, so I'll create the breakout rooms then. All right, is there one general question before we move to the breakout session? No, yes, somebody. If there's anybody who's going to one of the other breakout rooms who wants to ask a question of the other speaker first, that may be the precedence here for. <clears throat> yeah, so gonna... I, uh, I, am I audible? Uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, I was just looking at some uh, some of the literature, and uh, basically, uh, I think the the coronavirus, which uh, the thing that makes it very special is the RNA polymerase that it carries, and uh, that RNA polymerase with the double membrane structure, how it replicates uh, in the lytic cycle, uh, that particular mechanism could be useful. Uh, and uh, if we could study the uh, people who has adverse effect to uh, different drugs or therapies uh, for standard uh, with the standard therapies, uh, that could uh, tell us statistically uh, what could the key components which might be relevant for uh, those adverse side effects. Uh, so probably uh, that could help in standardization. Uh, it's just an Does anybody want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of the, the drugs like remdesivir and other um, antiviral drugs are targeting that, that, that pathway. Um, obviously, that's not my expertise being in, in immunology, but I think that uh, in some of the models that we've been working on, um, the viral replication pathway has been quite explicitly modeled. So I think that's definitely a, a good area of um, another area of investigation. Okay. Um, one of the problems I have running the meeting as host is that I have to stay in the main room. I can't jump, jump into the, the breakout rooms. So, so I think if it's okay, Penelope, is it okay if I put you into a breakout room? And then uh, Catherine, let's see what the what the, the 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 number of people who want to talk is. I have some questions for both of you, but I can't I have to stay in the main room. <laughs> so so let me Penelope, let me put you into the breakout room if it's okay. If 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 nobody joins and you're done, you're done. And in any case, you're done at four thirty. Right? So right. but but uh, let me put you in it. If you want to come back out, you can. Uh, you know the drill. Uh, people should be able to uh, join the rooms of their choosing. So is anybody, if anybody wants to talk to Penelope about the mute response, oh, she had so many interesting things to say, uh, you're welcome. And then maybe we'll have the leave stay in the, in the host to, to talk a little bit more about standards for the moment. I know there are several people in the room who are interested in the standards process, Jim Sluka, TJ, I know William also. Yeah, I'm kind of conflicted. I want to be in both rooms at once. You can jump into either one. Um, yeah. So, so, so um, I think Jacob and John just jumped in. Um, I was gonna stay out. I was gonna make the main meeting that, that's the standards discussion. So, so. Um, if that's okay, I better send a message to Jacob and John about that. Excuse me for just one second. 
Sorry, James, okay. you're going to keep the standards meeting here. You're not going to make it a breakout room. Is that what you just said? That, that was that. Was, I really, okay. I, 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 that's being selfish of me, but I really would like to hear the conversation and I can't okay. do it. If we need to, I'll move you. But if it's all okay. right, with you, I'll keep you in the main, the main meeting for both. It looks like there are plenty of people in the, in the immunology one. Um, there would be more if I could get my computer. Is there a trick to joining a breakout room? Uh, you should just be able to select. I, if you want me, to, who was that? Does that Joy? This is Joy Phillips. Yeah, I can see them. I see other people there, but it won't let me go there. Which one? You want, you want to go to immune response? Yes. Okay. Anybody else need help being moved into a room? James, I'm kind of exhausted after so many meetings. So <laughs> I think there are more smarter people in the room. So I'll, I'll, I'll thought I'll think more about this problem and uh, yeah, I'll join in the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay, so thank you, Catherine. Um, I just want to say again, thank you for, if anybody needs to be moved into the abuse response, please let me know. Uh, Jane, I have a request. Can Catherine stay in this room and John will, uh, uh, John cannot hear, uh, doesn't have the captions in the breakout room. And you have That's, them here. I just sent you an email saying, a message saying that we'll do it in the main room. So you okay, should because come out of he's, uh, I'll go back to the other room, I'll bring him out. This is an annoyance, a Zoom stand, a Zoom ah, here he is. stand annoyance. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, and if anybody needs to be moved to another session, please let me know, but I think we should be okay. So go ahead. I, I just wanted to say thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of all the things that we need to be reading uh, based on your discussion of Model Federation. I would have loved to have a longer talk where you actually dug into the issues of Model Federation. Uh, I think almost everything that we're dreaming of here in this working group requires the ability to build interoperable models that communicate uh, through uh, standard uh, data and, and, and interface protocols. Uh, and so I'm, I know, I know I'm, saying, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Lag. Um, uh, I give tutorials on both the DCEP and the HLA. Um, so, you know, if you decide that that has value um, at some point, I can just, I mean, it, they both take like an hour and a half, two hours, right? So that would completely wipe out a meeting. But if at some point you get to the point where you're like, oh, we're actually going to try and do this, I'd be happy to give you those tutorials so you don't just wander in blind. Because as with most standards, actually, my, my colleague, Richard Weatherly, um, with whom I worked on the early days, uh, HLA on the early days, um, used to say you can't infer gardening from gardening tools. And so, um, so, you know, don't, I just don't think that reading the standards a good way to learn it. So if you, if you want to learn the standard, I'm happy to give you a tutorial. So you kind of know which end is up. So Catherine. I have a question. Um, so suppose, well, suppose well, if you if you were to do do a few of those tutorials, I'd, I'd be interested in in in, in joining that. That would be interesting. Um, but okay, so suppose I have a bunch of models, and I go and I do the work to um, wrap them up so that they can talk according to these standards that we've that we've defined and that we have. What sort of tooling is there available to now take? this collection of models that's all sort of well-prepared and compliant with standards and to put them together and, and to make them and to make them do something useful. Well, that's, that's actually exactly what the, the HLA standard is about. Remember I, I, I went through it sort of quickly, but um, the thing you would do is go by yourself um, or get an open source, but, um, the open source versions, I think, are not very up to date, but um, get yourself an RTI, a runtime infrastructure. And that's a piece of software that makes these things talk to each other. And it's got a well-defined API and the HLA standard has a C++, Java, and WSDL API. Um, and that 
makes your simulations talk to each other. The other thing you will need in some form or another is something to, to build what's called, we call it a federation object model. But remember I talked about the cyber dem and developing that data exchange model. Okay, so for HLA, those things are called FOMS, federation object model. But it's kind of potato, potato. It's, it's basically, what are we gonna exchange at runtime? And there are tools for writing those. So if, if you, for example, um, with the cyber dam, right? We're, we're working to agree what that data is gonna be and what it means and, and what the data types are. When we're done with that, we're gonna build a whole bunch of versions of it that are simulation interoperability solution specific. Okay, and so that's the actual format you need to go with an actual standard. And I'm gonna do the HLA version and I have a copy of the tool where I can put all that data in and generate automatically generate the XML file that an RTI needs to make these things communicate. So there are lots of tools. So there's some software. So there's there's some software that's an RTI that I can get. Yep. Um, that knows how to read these descriptions of what the of what all the models do and how to put them together, and it does that. It yeah. It exchanges the data. Well, it does more than I mean. It's fundamentally about exchanging data, but it also has. Now I'm really feeling like I should have done the HLA tutorial. Um, <laughs> it's fundamentally about exchanging data, but um, but there are all these other mechanisms you need for simulation, um, including, um, I, I talked about time management. So if you're gonna run faster or slower than time management, or because I'm guessing you guys are gonna wanna do like Monte Carlo simulations where you do multiple runs and you need to control the variation through things like random seeds. Okay, so if you do that, yeah. Um, if you do any kind of analytical simulation, you need that. So, um, so it's got mechanisms for ensuring repeatability. Um, so, so that's in there. Um, there was some other thought there that just evaporated. Anyway, so, so there's that standard. The other thing is the commercial vendors um, have uh, at least, I know at least one of the commercial vendors has a tool and I think both of them has a, have a tool that basically takes that data exchange model, right? So you figure out what data you're gonna exchange, you write it in the right format. It reads those and it generates it APIs. It basically says, oh, if you wanna send this data, you know, to some other simulation, Here's an API for packing up that data the way it's supposed to be, so it can get unpacked on the other end, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So there's some um, there's some um, uh, basically uh, software development tools that keep you from having to do that kind of grunt work stuff yourself. But um, I'm 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 a little bit worried about the idea of having to you of having to go to commercial vendors because in some circumstances maybe that's okay. But it seems for scientific work, especially when you want the kind of reproducibility where anybody can take the stuff that you've done and reproduce it, they shouldn't have to, you know, pay a company to buy some software in order to reproduce it. They should just be able to reproduce it, right? True. In which case, you might want to look at some of the open source versions. But like I said, I'm not sure how up to date all of them are. Um, there's Portico. There was another one I've lost. I've forgotten the name of it. So, so that's a possibility. I think but, that, well, go ahead. I'm sorry, there's, a, there's always a lag, so you, you interrupt, and I apologize for that. Um, I wanted to follow up on that because you mentioned synchronization as an issue. And, and that's certainly something in a federated model for agent-based simulation. If they're running independently, you have events you have to be monitoring events in your universe, which may actually be some meta model that's living outside of the simulators of the individual agents. And you have to have some way of keeping track of time that's shared among the Federation. Yep. Um, and, and as you say, these are typically Monte Carlo models. Uh, as so you have issues of stochasticity and synchronization that could be fairly complex. I, I assume that the people, we were looking at the NVIDIA uh, projects on, on uh, interconnection and standardization. Of course, they're not standards in the sense that they're, they're coming from someplace. But, but of course, the people who do things like uh, animation, very large scale Hollywood animation have to deal with these kinds of problems a lot. 
it was sort of interesting to see what they're doing. I wonder if you could talk about these issues of temporal synchronization a little bit. Uh, oh boy, us. time management. Okay, I start doing a lot of time management these days, which is which is funny. I just it, it's I don't know. It's just come around. Um, so because you guys do this kind of simulation all the time, you know that in a standalone simulation, if you're if you're doing Monte Carlo simulation, you have some sort of discrete event simulation engine and it's got a queue and you, you take the next timestamp thing off the queue, you do whatever is appropriate based on what that event is. And as a result of that, you stick more things in the queue, right? And you just have this queue and you just go through it. And, you know, if you start with the same random seed, it's, you know, it's deterministic, it's repeatable and you get the same answer. And then of course, you know, you're doing Monte Carlo and then you change the random, you know, change the <clears throat> random seed, you know. Okay, so that's how that works. Now, if you have a federated simulation, um, you could actually have a single centralized event queue. Um, and basically every time anything happened in any simulation, then that simulation would send, you know, it's, next events to the centralized queue. And then the centralized queue would check and say, which is the next event? Which simulation does it go to? Now, even that introduces a problem because if it's going to multiple simulations, and this happens a lot in federated simulations, then you know who gets in the queue first? And, and by the way, there's an answer to this question. The time management, uh, timestamp representations was a big field of research when I was first getting started. There, there's ways to get repeatability, but you can imagine that that centralized queue really slows things down, right? Because everybody's waiting on that centralized queue. What you'd really like is for those those other those simulations to be able to move forward in time, but only up to the point where you don't introduce causality errors. Okay. That's tau and leaping. What's that? Tau leaping. It's basically tau leaping. It's a little bit like tau leaping. Like if you do your, you know, your Gillespie situation, your stochastic Gillespie situation uh, simulation, right? You know, you go and you pick events and you have them run and that sort of thing, right? Um, instead of picking them and making sure the state is coherent, you allow them to run a little bit um, without updating the state of the rest of the system. Right. Okay. Sorry, I don't know it by that term. There's a, there's something called time warp, which actually did a really clever guy who invented it was the genius um, that allows things to run ahead, and then you can roll them back if they got ahead. Um, uh, so uh, in HLA, what we actually do is we have a thing called look ahead, which is you know I, basically a contract between a each simulation and each individual simulation and the federated simulation saying, I promise whatever happens, I'm not going to schedule an event any sooner than whatever my, my current logical time is and, and the look ahead. And by having that, you can, you, you can give the simulations a little more latitude to move ahead faster. Um, and so what the RTI does is, uh, it keeps track of not the individual events, but what the logical time is at each simulation and what its look ahead is. So it knows, you know, what the earliest time it, there is that it can expect a message from that simulation. And then each of the individual simulations requests time advances from the RTI. And the RTI only grants those based on that global knowledge, but it doesn't have to keep the whole event queue. Um, it just needs to keep the logical time and the look ahead. And the reason that this is a valuable thing is if you, for example, have a, um, oh yeah, speculative execution, actually that's exactly what time warp is. Um, so what that lets you do is you can go, okay, well, I've got a whole bunch of simulations in my federation that, um, that sort of, um, I'll just say run quickly. So they, they take big time steps, right? And they only they do a couple of things and they take another big time step. Okay, and then I have another simulation that's very computationally intensive. Um, so like in the example of um, that I gave earlier, um, it's pointing me out about a meeting that's been canceled. Um, or I was talking earlier about um, 
say you've got your epidemiology model and then you've got your pattern of life um, simulation, that pattern of life simulation might be very rudimentary, right? It, it, it just, you know, it just it looks at a couple of values for that particular patient and, and calculates some kind of risk and passes that back to the epidemiology model, which requires a lot of computation, right? So the beauty of this is you can take that simulation that takes a lot of compute power and you can put it on a faster processor, right? And just let it run like mad, taking its little tiny steps, but get the whole federation moving forward at a reasonable rate, as opposed to everybody's always waiting for the simulation that takes a lot of, that takes a lot of cycles, basically. John, do you have your hand up? Um, what, you know, it might be a little helpful that the history of the origin of CISO and uh, DIS, the application was defense. And, and the big problem at the time was the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marine Corps were all spending millions of dollars on big war game systems. But you couldn't put an Army war game together with a Navy war game. These war game systems, you could set the clock to anything you want it. I could run five times real time because when you're training, you need to get past the slow stuff, but everything has to happen. Well, well, now we launch a missile that came from the enemy in the army war game and the Navy ship has got to shoot it. The, I don't know how you guys did it with the IS, but I know that time was a huge problem to deal with and they did it and then the other thing Catherine that that um, would be good to know this isn't limited to simulators that that the architectures that you build um, in the case of the military you know that that architecture was used so we connected real radars to simulators some of the things in the radar were coming from the simulator. Some of the things in the radar were real. Their software had absolutely nothing to do with each other inside. It was all the federated connection. And, and so when you look at our use, if you have a simulator and you have a compliant medical device that is the heart monitor, the connection of the heart monitor data to your model is like goes through the same interface that you built to connect simulators. Is that overstating? No, it's not actually. And, and thank you for bringing up that point, John. So um, we have a term LVC in, in defense simulation, live virtual constructive. Um, constructive is the kind of simulation um, you guys mostly do. So that's um, that's one person running a simulation that does a lot of things. Uh, uh, virtual is probably not germane here. Although um, if you think about um, uh, medical mannequins um, for um, that, that would sort of qualify as virtual. We, we describe it as, you know, one live person actually operating um, one piece of equipment. So like a tank simulator or cockpit simulator is a, the classic example of, a, of a, a virtual simulation. And then what John's talking about is live. And the idea with live is you actually build a connection between some actual live system and your simulation. Now, um, that's a little trickier because you have to hook into whatever the protocol is there. Um, the other thing is um, usually if you're building a simulation that involves live and or virtual, you can't, it can't really be time managed because there's something else in the real world that's in the loop, um, which, is, which is driving your time scale. Um, you, you can't get repeatability with human beings. It turns out, you know, human beings are squishy and, you know. <laughs> no, but we kind of have, we kind of have this... We kind of have this a little bit, but not nearly as formalized, right? So, you know, you think of the epidemic models that we have, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. that are meant to, you know, you run them forward in time and they go and they give some kind of forecast what they think is going to happen in the future, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, they don't do this from a vacuum. They do this based on the data that has been measured in the, you know, in the recent past, right? Mm-hmm. So you go and you run the simulation and it runs forward. And then you wait a day or a week and then you have some more data comes in. Mm-hmm. And then you run it and then you refit it and run it again, right? So it's 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 very much the same kind of pattern. It is coupled um, through the fitting process to the data that comes from the live system. And it goes and it speculatively executes what it's good, what it thinks is going to happen in the future. And uh, you only ever really keep a little bit of that as you, you know, keep following, sort of following along. But it is, you know, we do, we do have these things that are, you know, that are coupled to the live system. Well, if we're ever going to do, use models as part of digital twin scenarios, then you'll have very tight coupling. Very tight coupling. Well, this is something we're very interested in in this group. At the moment, you can't do, as you heard from Penelope, you can't do effective immunomodulation therapy because you can't predict individual, and I'm going to use the word predict, and Jacob will let me go, uh, predict individual patient immune response. Uh, And that means that most immunotherapies that have been developed, some serious ones, have failed uh, because you can't titrate them. Because giving you the same medication that somebody else needs, that I can give to somebody else will kill you and save them. And you can't say which whether it's going to be which, because timing is important. Uh, And so ultimately, these models may be used in very different ways. One of them could be drug development, which is a population style thing. One of them would be virtual postulations, which Penelope talked about. But one of them could, in fact, be a model of your immune system running in synchronization with measurements of your immune system to give a continual forecast of what's going to happen to you over the next hour so that we could do medical intervention. Well, that would be amazing. Uh, And that's actually one of our key goals, I think, uh, at least for some members of this group. Uh, to, to be able to get to that kind of a close integration between real world and, and simulator. Uh, so, so that's one of the concepts that we're very interested in understanding. Uh, it's, it's still a dream, but I think it's, it's something that we want to understand what the issues are. Uh, we have this huge problem with the electronic health records where, where the standards the small ones are trying to get together and have one and some of the big ones say, screw you, ours is the standard, do it our way. You don't have to do it anybody's way. All you need to do is ask that they be interface compliant with their output. You don't care how, what they call it, what they do with it inside their record. That's what the hospital buys is what they like. But when the data goes out, that's where, that's where the data meets the Federation standard so that the other one can grab the data off and knows what to do with it to put it into their form. True? Assuming all the data is there. Uh, I have a question for you, and this is related to what John is asking. Are you in communication with CDISC? It's the I'm sorry. CDISC. C D I S C. The name doesn't ring a bell. So it's a, it's it's the organization that does standardization for healthcare data. They're uh, also yeah. open standard. It's like the their own IEEE. So uh, you're not connected to them. Uh, no, but there I'll are lots of them. like yeah, lots of standards organizations out there in you know specific domains. So. Yeah, so this is the one that you should be talking to. They don't have that much uh, modeling and simulation experience, they, but they are de- dealing with data. So they, for example, have like the biggest unit uh, database that I encountered and stuff like that. So this is where it connects to what John is saying because no one, the, the companies are there starting to build this up. So, but I, I'll try to make the connection and. Uh, uh, and this is also something that's tied up to John. He's trying to organize a, a meeting by at the NIH. And this is something which, will you be willing maybe to, to do a workshop there or something like this, or at least a talk? Um, 
If, if it works with my schedule, yes. It's in November, but okay, we'll, we'll talk to you then. Okay. Uh, but also, I, I want William to tell her, to, to tell you what he's doing about composition. It's relevant to what I'm doing with ensembles, but he's composing models and he has mathematical definitions of those. So this is something that may be interesting. Do you have standards to do this? So William, can you tell her? Um, we were talking about that. Actually, we were corresponding in email uh, recently about, um, about just that sort of thing. Um, there is a gap between uh, the nice, uh, you know, the nice, very clean theoretical picture and what happens when you actually try to do it. Um, in theory, and theory and practice are the same and practice not so much. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, but but yeah, I mean we've uh, uh, no we've 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 we have yeah we've 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 talked about that a little bit. Um, I would be interesting. I would be interested to to understand how well the theory maps onto the standards that you've developed. Because I don't know. I mean, because I because I I suspect I might be wrong, and you correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. But I suspect that it is ta that um, those are all done and have all been done for a long time, mainly from an engineering point of view. They've not not necessarily from a from a theoretical computer science point of view. So I'd be interested to see how that maps together. Well, a couple of things. So. Um... When you look at standards like the HLA, um, I mean, it really is fundamentally an engineering endeavor. And so everything we've done is based on use cases and, and user experience. Um, so I'm not sure it was ever a theoretical question. Now, there's there's been attempts over the years at um, theoretical representations of model composability, but none of them have, uh, wait a minute, it's not coming into focus. <laughs> That's no, you, funny, you have... showing you the background. What I'm, no, trying, just... to, I'm trying to hold up um, Robin, Mil Robin Milner's Pi Calculus book, The Communicating and Mobile Systems, The Pi Calculus by Robin Milner. It's from the early, 19, from the early 1980s. Um, uh and yeah the reason i was holding up is i was is i was wondering if uh if it is something that had been like i was wondering if you'd i was wondering if you'd recognize it from uh from from your work over the years or if this if these the kinds of ideas in this had had um uh, uh were part of were part of the collection of ideas that you've been working with um, they're, they're not, but um, so I'm going to inject something here. Almost uniformly, you all say model and I say simulation. And I think the reason that we have that difference is that um, for me, a model is a mathematical or algorithmic representation or abstraction of something. And a simulation is the execution of that model over time in some piece of software. And for certain... Um, for certain applications, actually, a lot of applications I work in, that distinction is very important. I and, agree. That's critical. Okay. That's yeah, critical. And, so, and there's also a level of conceptual model that we haven't even addressed that I would have loved to ask you about. Next time. Um, next time. And so a lot of what I do is focused on simulation interoperability because that's all about getting simulations to talk to each other and so more about the mechanics and the engineering problems of those and less about what I would say is sort of a meta modeling problem of, you know, can we compose these individual simulations? Um, I'll, just, I'll just say the following thing. I didn't really get to VVNA earlier, but um, a colleague of mine, Michael Petty, um, many years ago, finest theoretical computer scientist I know, did a proof about the, um, non-proof of validity from composing um, otherwise valid models. And um, 
And so that's kind of in the area of, you know, can we compose these things? Do we have good enough meta models? Is the composition valid once we compose them? And so, yes, there's a big problem there. Um, I, I don't dispute it, although I will say, well, maybe two things. One is we have enough simulation interoperability problems to keep people like me busy. And, and also at some point um, um, with, with, mo with meta modeling, um, as it gets more and more detailed, eventually it becomes the model or the simulation. Sure. Yeah. Well, we, we've, we, we promised you we would let you go at exactly 4.30 and we've overrun. Oops. So I don't want to keep you from your next meeting. I know you said you had <laughs> Oh, thanks. <laughs> a hard cut off at 4.30. Four meetings. I hate, Try, I hate to, I trying hate, to make dinner. <laughs> I hate I hate cutting off the discussion because it's 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 been tremendously rewarding. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. But you know, like James, you. There's... I hope you'll give us. I hope you will. We have this uh, model inter sim really simulation interoperability uh, and validation subgroup, and that would be the ideal place to organize a workshop where you present for an hour and a half. Uh, and, then, and then we could advertise that to the membership and we'd get the people, uh, the people, if you're willing to do that, that would be very, very kind of you. Uh, and, we're, we and we're already talking about it for the IMAG conference as workshop material. And um, the other problem is the other kind of standards that are still relevant, but don't do the same thing like fire and the C disk that that Jacob mentioned, somebody in our community that understands them well enough to lay them side by side and see which standards address what. And, and we got to do that because I don't know if fire covers the data movement or just the standard form for data. Uh, the CDIS is now required by the FDA. I mean, you have a standard. If the FDA won't let you submit clinical trial with not complying to see this, it's a freaking standard. It may be voluntary. You can volunteer to submit your data or not. But, but we really need some people who understand the mission of the multi-scale modeling desire to combine models with the understanding of the rest of the world of standards in medicine. Because there's tons of them and they're standards. So somebody, somebody knows a bunch of people that understand this stuff that are interested in doing it for medical simulation, gather them up, bring them into the outreach group. Now we'll corral them together and put them to work. Okay, well, John, I guess you have the last word today. Um, Catherine, I want to thank you again for staying over. We promised you 4.30. Uh, 